Now what we're going to do is come to understand how kinetic measurements, in particular elucidation of the rate law, can allow us to distinguish between proposed or potential or plausible reaction mechanisms. Let's consider the reaction of NO2 gas with CO gas to form products. Let's imagine also that there are two plausible mechanisms that we've come up with here. A single step mechanism, basically in which an oxygen atom is transferred in one step, and a two-step mechanism in which an oxygen atom is transferred between NO2 molecules first, and then an NO3 reactive intermediate transfers an oxygen to CO to form CO2. And then our second proposed mechanism, notice the kinetics. The first step is slow, and the second step is relatively fast. Each of these mechanisms implies a rate law. And using the idea about the connection between molecularity and connect kinetic order in elementary steps that we developed previously, we can infer the observed rate law from the mechanism. For the single step mechanism, this just draws on our basic understanding of this connection. So for example, we can notice that if we call the rate constant for this step k, the step is unimolecular in NO2 and unimolecular in CO. And so the rate law we would observe is rate is equal to K times the concentration of NO2 to the first power times the concentration of CO to the first power. For the two-step mechanism, this is a little bit more complicated because we've got two steps. How do we know which step drives the rate? Well, let's first define the rate constants for each step, K1 and K2. Let's also notice that the first step is slow and the second step is fast. The fast step is actually not relevant to the rate law. The slow step is what drives the reaction rate. And there's a metaphor here you can think about, for instance, shopping at the grocery store. If everyone's going to the grocery store just to get one item and they know exactly where it is, but the cashiers are really, really slow, the majority of the time spent in the grocery store will involve getting through the checkout line. Right? The time spent getting items is going to be negligible compared to the time spent waiting to get your items rung up. And so it's that checkout step that really drives the reaction time, or the time spent in the grocery store, I should say, and really what drives the rate of people getting in and out of the grocery. Right? Same idea here. The slow step is what drives the rate. The fast step is not relevant to the rate law. The slow step is what we call the rate-determining step. And so the rate law here will be the rate law for the first elementary step. K1, the rate constant for the first step, times the concentration of NO2 squared, since that first step is bimolecular in NO2. So after making these inferences, what we can do is actually measure the rate law, right? And compare the measured rate law to these two hypothetical predictions and see which one matches. And whichever one matches, will correspond to the actual mechanism that takes place, the measured mechanism, if you like. This slide just reiterates this point that we saw in the second proposed mechanism, the two-step mechanism, about the slow step driving the rate. What is the rate-determining step of shopping for groceries? Well, if everybody's going in, grabbing one apple and waiting in the checkout line, and the cashiers are very, very slow, the rate of getting people in and out of the grocery store is going to depend on the speed of the cashiers only and not, for example, how many apples the grocery store has, assuming we have enough to satisfy every customer, right? Adding more apples will not accelerate people getting in and out of the grocery store. What will affect people getting in and out of the grocery store is how quick our cashiers are. So better training for the cashiers, better technology, more checkout lanes, are going to accelerate the rate of people getting through the grocery. That step that dictates the rate is known as the rate determining step. And it's this step where changes in concentration and changes in the rate constant for that specific elementary step have an impact on the rate. And important for this connection between mechanism and rate law, the rate law of the rate determining step is the observed rate law of the reaction overall, since none of the much faster steps have anything to do with the actual reaction rate. In this practice problem, we're asked to derive the overall balanced chemical equation 
and the rate law implied by this mechanism here. To determine the balanced chemical equation, we can apply the idea that the sum of the mechanistic steps must add up to the overall balanced equation. So to add up the steps, we simply add step one and step two. One thing to notice is that NOCl2 is on the product side in the first step and the reactant side in the second step. It's a reactive intermediate, and so it does not appear in the overall balanced equation, which is two NO molecules react with one Cl2 molecule to form two NOCl. Now, what about determining the rate law? Well, we first want to determine which step is rate determining or rate limiting. And to do that, let's define a couple of constants, little k sub two for the rate constant for the second step and capital K sub one for the equilibrium constant of the first step. Let's think about which of these is the rate determining step in order to write the rate law for it. Well, the fact that the first step is fast, what does that mean? Well, that means that the first step is going to reach chemical equilibrium, is going to be at a point where the forward and reverse reactions are at equal rates before the second step, which is much slower, actually kicks in. We'll have more to say about chemical equilibrium in a later chapter, but for the time being, take my word for it that that first step is at equilibrium and that we can characterize the ratio of product to reactant concentrations by this constant capital K1. We're going to use that here in a second. The second step is the rate determining step. And the rate law for that, we can simply write by looking at the molecularity on the reactant side for this step. The rate of that step is equal to K2 times the concentration of NOCl2 to the first power times the concentration of NO to the first power. Now we could just leave it at that, but the problem with this is that NOCl2 is a reactive intermediate. And so its concentration will be quite small. It's quite unstable, quite short-lived and rather difficult to measure. So what we want to try to do is substitute the NOCl2 concentration for a different concentration, ideally the concentration of one or more of the reactants. And we can do that by applying the equilibrium expression for the first step. Capital K sub one is equal to the product concentration NOCl2 divided by the reactant concentrations multiplied by each other, NO concentration, Cl2 concentration. So now we can do some rearranging and isolate the NOCl2 concentration in this equation. And after doing that and then plugging in this expression for NOCl2 concentration, we arrive at the rate is equal to little k2 times the equilibrium constant for the first step, the NO concentration squared times the Cl2 concentration. And finally, we can notice that little k2 and big K1 are both constants. We can wrap those both up into a new rate constant. Let's just call that K prime. And we arrive at the final rate law, which is the rate is equal to K prime times the NO concentration squared times the CL2 concentration. So a little bit of math there, a little bit of incorporating chemical equilibrium, which if you're not familiar with yet, don't worry, we'll get there in time. This allowed us to write the rate law entirely in terms of the concentrations of the reactants, NO and CL2. This slide makes the point that we can also reason in the opposite direction. If we know the rate law, we can infer a plausible reaction mechanism that is consistent with that rate law. So let's consider, for example, again, the reaction of NO2 and CO. Below 225 degrees C, the rate law has this form with NO2 and CO both being first order. And if we return to our two plausible mechanisms for this process, the rate law that is consistent, the mechanism that is consistent with that rate law is the first mechanism, the single step mechanism in which the stoichiometry of the overall reaction matches the orders in the rate law because the reaction occurs in a single elementary step. And so in that first case where the rate law is first order in both NO2 and CO, the mechanism must involve a single step. What about the second case, above 225 degrees C? Well, in that case, the rate is equal to K times the NO2 concentration squared. Here now, CO does not appear, so we're probably dealing with a multi-step mechanism here. And our other plausible mechanism, you'll recall, we developed the rate law consistent with that, that mechanism was K times the NO2 concentration squared. So in that second case, 
where we measured the rate law to be K times NO2 concentration squared is equal to the rate, the mechanism must involve a two-step process in which two NO2 molecules are involved in the first rate determining step. And actually that measured rate law also tells us that the first step is rate determining since CO doesn't enter into the rate law at all. The reaction is zero order in CO. And notice that this mechanism helps us understand why the reaction is zero order in CO. It's the same reason the number or concentration of apples in the grocery store didn't affect our rate of getting people out of the grocery. CO doesn't enter into the mechanism until after the slowest point, and so it gets very quickly consumed after that first step has taken place. So changing the concentration of CO won't affect the reaction time or the reaction rate. 